Welcome everybody to our last March uh, IMAG MSM working group meeting. I expect there'll be people logging in for the next few minutes. As usual, I need to remind people that this meeting is being recorded, it's being live streamed, and that the recordings will be made available afterwards. Appreciate those of you who are here. We have two speakers lined up and uh, we'll be getting to that in just a minute. As usual, I want to remind you that uh, Reinhardt and I are the co-leads of the working group at the moment. Uh, we have web administration from Jim Sluka and other kinds of help from Jim Sluka. And you all hear regularly from Bruce Shapiro, who is on a well-deserved holiday this week. I also want to remind you that we have a Slack channel, Twitter channel, the IMAG MSM wiki page, IMAG LinkedIn page, and we have a YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, these only work if people use them. So please help us uh, populate that uh, channel to make sure that uh, our efforts are seen. In particular, the YouTube channel has recordings of all of the speakers, uh, all of the great speakers that we've had. And I hope that people will help us uh, make sure that those videos are recorded because we know that there are many people in the working group who aren't able to make this slot, our Asian colleagues, it's awkward. Uh, for some of our European colleagues, it's quite late. And therefore making sure that the uh, recordings of the talks are available is important. We're trying a, a, a bit of an experiment today and usually these things take a little bit of time to develop. Um, and that is, we, there was a request that we have an announcement section. And the idea here is that people can make a brief announcement, try to keep it under a minute. If you have a slide, make it one slide. Uh, you don't have to tell us in advance. Uh, you're welcome to speak up now. Uh, but if you would like uh, to let us know in advance, uh, we could include your slide in deck so you don't have to screen share. And we can also include it in the official agenda for the meeting, uh, which may get a little more PR because it'll reach out to the people who are not just physically present, but to all the working group members. So I'd like to call now uh, for the as a question, does anybody have any uh, announcements for today? Again, this is new, so if you don't, that's fine. Uh, but we had a request at the steering group that we have this option. So I'd like to make it available. And you just speak up if you have an announcement. Um, I, I have one, James. I, I, yeah, it's actually it was in my slide deck for my talk, but it's a meeting that's coming up. Um, and I could share a screen here just to show you the, oh, um, I can't share a screen, I guess. Okay, let me try again. It's called Visualize Med. And it's about uh, bringing, give me a second here. Can you see that? Yes, that's great. Okay. Yeah, modeling and simulation for therapy development. This is the second version of this now. The first one was in Minneapolis a year and a half ago. This will be virtual and um, encourage you to check it out. Um, I'll be speaking in it and also organizing a couple sessions. Uh, Stacy Finley, John Burke, Allison Kloss. Stacy's at USC. John's the CEO of Applied Biomath in Cambridge and Allison's in the modeling group at Novartis in Cambridge. And then there'll be a road mapping opportunity the day after to kind of scope out how can we get uh, mathematical modeling more integrated into pharma, pharma and biotech industry and affecting FDA, um, in, improving FDA applications. So thanks. That's great. I think, I wish I had known about it, that, that I missed that. And it's something that I think a lot of the working group members would find very interesting. So if you, if you send us that uh, link, we'll send that on to everybody in the working group as well. Thank you. I, I put it in the chat. Uh, Reinhardt, can you grab that and pass it on to, uh, to Bruce to send on? Yes, we'll do. Uh, Jacob, you had an announcement. Yeah, it's a pre-announcement. It's something that uh, Sharif, Armin Sharif, uh, he's a little bit late, but uh, he will announce it, but we're, he's planning a workshop on teaching uh, for disability, it's uh, probably will happen around June. Look out for the announcements. I'm trying to let people know ahead of time because if they have models, we, we will teach you how to do things properly 
and make it more producible. So start preparing your models. This is why it's a prayer announcement. Roman Sharif will be here. He'll talk about it more. Okay, wonderful. Any other announcements? Uh, Jacob, do you have a URL or something that um, we could use? This is why I said it's a prayer announcement. Sharif is handling this. So he, he's, he's just a little bit late, so I didn't want to miss the opportunity. We need the people to start preparing their models. This is why I'm announcing it. He's on the call. If, if. He's here? And, and, I, know, and, I, I, I just joined when you started to, to speak. Yeah. So announce the workshop. <laughs> I think I think it's okay. You already did. So we will have a two days workshop. I think we did it last time as well. So I'm still finalizing the details. Once I have them, uh, hopefully in the next week or so, I will share with everyone. So it's a hands-on workshop where everyone comes with their own model, and then we try to encode them in SBML or different tools and make them more reproducible and sh uh, share with the, the rest of the community and see if we can integrate some of these models together. Okay, lovely. Thank you. That's perfect. This is exactly the kind of thing that we're hoping to have uh, announced. I should say, I guess, in the spirit of a pre-announcement is that uh, the last week of July, we will have our annual uh, Tellurium uh, Network Dynamics Modeling course taught by Herbert Sauer of the University of Washington. And then we'll have our annual CompuCell workshop uh, the first week of August. And I hope by next week or the week after to have the formal announcements for that too. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for sharing your opportunities. And now I will move on. I just wanted to mention quickly that uh, people uh, last week, uh, Reed from NIAD, uh, shared this uh, NIH set of RFAs, um, which are primarily in data science, uh, but may have some modeling component. I've written to the program director for clarification. Uh, and besides the statement that they're primarily interested in data science, I've not had a formal clarification yet. I'm, if I find out any more, I will report it. Uh, I know many people in the community might be interested in those. So I just wanted to make sure those were highlighted again. Uh, in the slide deck, there's the, the specific RFA calls. I'm not gonna go through those in great detail today. Something that we are interested in that came up in the steering group uh, meeting last week was that if there are new collaborations that have developed, uh, and I know uh, there are several, um, I know it's work to report those, but if you could report back to us on whether these meetings, either the direct meetings, the subgroup meetings, or uh, the email lists have helped you build new collaborations. Uh, that is considered an important uh, metric of the success of the working group. Uh, and so if you have written a paper with someone else in the working group, if you're writing a grant with someone else in the working group, if you're preparing a teaching a modeling resource, or even if you're simply bouncing ideas off people you wouldn't have met otherwise, uh, if you could document that even in a sentence or two and send it on to us as the organizers, that would be extremely helpful for us in our planning and our working with the uh, IMAG MSM. Our upcoming meetings next week, we have two meetings on Thursday. I hope that is manageable for people. Uh, we have a special meeting with a longer talk uh, by Rita, Rita Colwell, uh, University of Maryland, who's gonna be talking about her modeling and experimental work uh, in epidemiology is it focusing on cholera in particular. Uh, people will recognize her name as a longtime director of the National Science Foundation. And we're very pleased she's, she's going to speak to us. And then in the afternoon, uh, we'll have Don Yin from the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison speaking at the regular time. And we're going to try the experiment of reserving a slot for group discussion as was also requested by the uh, steering committee. Uh, April 8th, we have uh, James Moore uh, and Denise Kirschner speaking. April 15th, uh, two speakers. April 22nd, Deborah Peters uh, from USDA, uh, who works on very large scale, uh, multi scale modeling of animal zoonotics, and uh, we'll be talking about how to organize very large scale consortia. Uh, and uh, then you see the rest. 
As always, we are delighted to have suggestions for future speakers. We remind you that prior speakers are welcome to speak again after an appropriate impact interval if you have new things to say. Um, and so we hope that people will enjoy the lineup that we have for the next few months. It's a reminder for the rules of the meeting, and we always would appreciate in meeting questions. I didn't clear uh, with David and Jacob whether you're available for the half hour after the meeting to discuss in more detail. Uh, if you are, we have the breakout rooms set up. If those breakout rooms work, wonderful. If nobody shows up to your breakout room, then you're free to go. Uh, last week, we had a lot of breakout room participation, and uh, that was a big success. I hope that that will be something that people will use. And I'll remind my, have, especially today, because we have a slightly longer agenda than usual, I will provide a five minute warning. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes into the talk uh, so that our speakers are uh, keep on schedule. We need to finish the talks definitively by the hour uh, deadline. That's why we have the half hour afterwards for, for more free to form discussion. Hope that's okay for people. And I do appreciate that the short form is difficult. These are teaser talks. And with that, we'll turn it over to David. As you know, I don't do much of a preamble. I think almost everyone will know him already uh, and the exciting work that he's been doing uh, as a teaser. Uh, and I'm sure that we have lots to ask him about afterwards. Great, thanks, uh, James. And uh, thanks to the group for uh, inviting me to speak today. And um, James, I'm afraid I do have office hours for my class, right? after this. So um, maybe if I can just put my email in the chat there. If people really want to follow up, I'd be happy to schedule a time to meet that works for both of us um, by Zoom um, or phone, however you want to do it. How does that sound? Okay. Okay, that's fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if we picked an inconvenient time for you, but that's, uh, I appreciate you. Yeah, no. sometimes nobody shows up, but um, can't be guaranteed. So I probably should hang out there. Um, all right, so should I proceed then, James? Please, go ahead. Yep, okay. Right, so um, I'll tell you today about some of the work that we've been doing. Is that the correct or incorrect view? Is that like the, the presenter or the? Yes, it's good. It's good? Yeah, you don't see correct. Flat. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, so our normal research, let's say, has been in uh, recent years in the cancer space and focusing on really the physics of migration. And we're trying to expand that to like the whole tumor simulation of cell division and death. That's been our main thing. We've been funded by the National Cancer Institute for the last uh, five years for the Physical Sciences and Oncology Center, PSOC. Um, and that's that work is multi-scale. We're trying to span from atoms up to tumors and, and the time scales from sub nanosecond out to weeks. And, and um, that's been our normal thing. I, I did want to tout the, the meeting that I did earlier, but I can skip that. But as you all know, and everyone had the same I think, experience, a global experience of uh, we had to shut down our lab about a year ago. We do microscopy and imaging to test our models. Uh, and had to shift the lab basically to this place where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> That's my cat, Simone. And uh, kind of kind of uh, started to think a little bit about, was there an opportunity in COVID? There certainly was a need to try to understand what, what drugs might be useful in the clinic to move forward uh, to into clinical trials that might be useful as antivirals, for example. And there literally were hundreds of proposed drugs and, and uh, thousands of trials that opened up globally and are still open. Uh, and yet we don't really have a solid antiviral, certainly not one outside the clinic. Um, and so this is uh, still a pressing need. And that's what I'll tell you about today is how about a year ago, I connected with two of the clinical trial PIs at the University of Minnesota. who are running the hydroxychloroquine trial and the remdesivir trial, uh, David Bulware and Susan Klein, respectively, part of, uh, in Susan's case, a larger national trial. And what we endeavored to do was to build a model for the replication life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 um, 
basically leveraging extant knowledge on SARS-CoV-1 as our starting point under the hypothesis that SARS-CoV-2 would not be terribly different from it. Of course, we didn't know, but what else did we have at the time? So we started to build the model from that scaffold uh, from that literature guided by experts in the field. So infectious disease and immunology experts highlighted on the right-hand side in blue, as well as the clinical trial PIs highlighted in green and some of our PSOC investigators highlighted in gold. And that team then worked together over the course of about two months, meeting weekly and iteratively developing modeling, uh, a model developed by Brian Castle, a postdoc in my group, a differential equation-based model, mass action, kinetics, and so forth, um, guided by the literature to produce uh, this map on the left. And we want to map specific drugs onto it to see if those drugs were going to be targeting what we might call vulnerabilities in the replication life cycle. Those parts that if you did target them would be predicted to have a big impact on the rate of replication as measured by the number of virions produced over time on the right-hand side. So if you could change the time that it takes to produce a burst of virions from a few hours to much longer than that, that would be a very sensitive part of this system. So we started to do that, um, but put that model together and identify where those sensitivities are. And we had to you know, see whether our model was decently predictive. We withheld some of the literature as uh, used some for training and some for testing. So the grayed out ones are the ones that were used to test and the black ones were used to build um, the, for training. And it actually hit a number of things that were kind of intriguing. For example, the ratio of genomic um, uh, RNA to negative sense RNA was at least uh, 10 to one. And uh, that's number eight or letter H there, for example. So it, it actually captured some things that it wasn't obvious that the model would necessarily capture um, when we tested it after training it with A, B, C, and E. And then we looked systematically single parameter at a time, then varying from that base parameter set to find sensitivities in it. Of course, some you change them, it doesn't really change the outcome at all. KXO, for example, others are moderately sensitive, like the middle case, and then some are very sensitive. Um, this RDRP step is a transcription, uh, is the, is the uh, stepping of the, of the transcription process. And if you go system-wide then across all the parameters, you can kind of see now a map of how if you start with the base parameter set in the middle and make fold changes one at a time in them uh, up or down. And here we're thinking going up would be an inhibition of that step, each of which is uh, required for the overall replication, um, which ones are most sensitive. And you can see as you go up, uh, some of them you hit a very, uh, a big effect, like a, a didn't even really complete the cycle on time scale of tens of hours in the case of this uh, HRDRP parameter. Um, others, you know, were not as sensitive, like this one, um, the K, the first, the second, and third parameters that involve viral entry didn't, were not predicted to be very sensitive. And that's where hydroxychloroquine, for example, would be expected to map, whereas remdesivir would block the transcription more down the middle there where, where the green arrows pointing that would be predicted to be a better a vulnerability to target in the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle. And I'll tell you a little bit too today about uh, fluvoxamine as another one is targeting ones that are associated with sigma one and two receptors further down. These are the three, uh, two, the first two of the three um, kind of vulnerabilities. And the third vulnerability is in translation, protein translation. And I'll tell you a little bit today about metformin as a way to target that and where we're at. Um, okay, so um, just to summarize then how that map looks, then there are certain nodes, certain parameters in the model that are predicted to be vulnerable and therefore effective if targeted, everything else being equal, and others that were predicted to be less effective at, or able to be targeted. And I just want to uh, say that, you know, with a sufficiently strong inhibition, even a, a, some of these less in a less effective targeting strategies could still work. So it doesn't mean they wouldn't work necessarily, it just means that everything else being equal, you'd rather go after the green parts of the diagram and not the red. That's where the sensitivities were predicted to lie. So that was where we ended up and we put that on BioArchive and um, encourage you to uh, check it out. And uh, if you think there are collaborative opportunities based on that, I'm happy to kind of uh, engage with you around that. 
Um, but we started to then shift into how can we apply this or test it? And of course, uh, uh, literature was coming out and really an important study, I think early on was from a group that did a repurposing uh, study of a lot of different drugs and looking at the, uh, the protein interaction map to look for potential targets and drug repurposing and which parts of this process would be what were popping up in their screens as the ones that were most vulnerable. And it did align with two of the three hotspots that um, we identified, specifically translation and uh, sigma one, sigma two receptors, that third uh, vulnerability in a later stage of the replication downstream. So that was encouraging, um, but uh, you know, we wanna see, could we identify a drug or drugs that would hit those nodes? Like, can we use this as a map to, to guide our own clinical trial development? And this is where I started to work with uh, Chris Tignanelli, who is one of the PIs on the um, COVID trials here, um, to identify in here using his skills in natural language processing and informatics to identify specific drugs that based on that method would be predicted to be effective. And a good alignment came with metformin, which can inhibit mTORC1 and uh, among other things, um, and uh, in, in turn retard the translation of the viral structural proteins. And so we started to uh, look at metformin as a potential drug and some others too, but this one really stood out. Uh, it was corroborated by some initial human lung tissue data that uh, Matt Schaller and Greg Sawyer obtained at the University of Florida. And you can see, for example, metformin, two of the um, five donor patients having a pretty good response to it. It's interesting that heterogeneity, like that it's not, it, this may be the case that some patients are gonna respond well for reasons we don't fully understand, but maybe encoded in the map that I showed you and, and others may, may not. Um, so, um, and similarly, sirolimus, which is another uh, translation inhibitor also had, a, had a, a pretty good effect. So the reasons why we want to move forward with metformin clinically would be that our bio, a biophysical model predicts that this is hitting a good target. Um, Chris's natural language processing identified protein synthesis and specifically metformin as a good candidate. Um, the drug repurposing study by Gordon et al. Nature identified metformin as it's one of the few drugs that had that they could show in vitro had had a decent effect. And uh, Chris and coworkers had a, did an observational study here in the Twin Cities on people who are already on metformin and then their uh, response to um, SARS-CoV-2 challenge uh, being better um, than everyone else, but that's observational. So it still would require a prospective randomized clinical trial. And, and then the in vitro study that I showed you with human lung tissue. And lastly, and this is pretty important is it, ideally, this drug is already out there. It's available. It's relatively safe and inexpensive and available globally. And I think this is important if it's we're going to have global impact with these and not a very expensive drug that's only available to a small fraction of the world's population. So this really hit a lot of the marks. Um, and just briefly, here's the observational um, result. It's not real strong effect, but it's it's statistically significant and. Um, it, it suggests that metformin is, is worth further consideration at least. So all that package together, what I just showed you on the, uh, the, the list is led to um, a COVID trial that's enrolling now for metformin. Um, we've enrolled over 30 patients. We have sites uh, open now in the Twin Cities and Chicago with one in Los Angeles and Denver that will start enrolling soon. So that's uh, where we're at with that uh, within 12 months, less than, um, starting from scratch and having a phase three clinical trial that's currently enrolling. And we hope to uh, complete that enrollment. If you have ways to, if you're interested in that, being a part of that trial, if there are any clinical trialists in the, in the group here, um, be happy to chat with you about it. I'll just point out a couple other directions about the trial is that we're looking at expansion because there are three vulnerabilities, not just one. Translation protein translation is one, and we think metformin can take uh, can uh, have some impact there. But the start, uh, sigma one, sigma two receptors I mentioned as well uh, led to identification of fluvoxamine as potentially um, effective, and so that's another one that we predict would be a good one to focus on. And we're going to um, 
likely going to expand our trial to include combination between metformin and fluvoxamine, uh, as well as a possible third agent. So a multi-arm trial, um, multi-site, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial. And uh, John, I got just like one or two more slides, and then I'm happy to take questions. How's that sound? Um, That's fine. You're right on target. So, and we'll okay. do, we'll do yeah, your almost... questions uh, now because that if you can't stay later, it's important that we have the opportunity. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that's, sounds great. Here's our current scorecard. Um, and remdesivir at the top is, was one of the first that was given the emergency use authorization. Certainly not a home run, but it has some utility in the clinic and is, is in standard practice right now. Uh, you go down the list, uh, hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir, ritinavir were pretty clear failures um, in, in multiple attempts. So, um, And Dave Bower, uh, uh, who we've been collaborating with, was the PI in two of those hydroxychloroquine trials. So um, we shared our results, our prediction rather, with Dave before we knew the results of his trial. <laughs> Um, and it, he was, um, he wouldn't tell us the results of his trial before we told him what our prediction was going to be. You go down the list, there are various stages, uh, getting, going from less certainty, you're going to lower certainty at the bottom. And, um, I mentioned fluvoxamine already. I think, uh, that's already passed a, had a efficacy signal in phase two. So we counted as at this point provisionally correct. So that's kind of where we're at. It's it's uh, seven for seven in at, in predicting efficacy in clinical trials so far. We'll see where that ends up. Of course, um, we've got some preliminary human lung tissue data with Matt Schaller at Florida to support that. And I think the big picture is we're I, I'm becoming more convinced we can use biophysical modeling to objectively prioritize which drugs should be moving forward in a rapidly evolving situation like this. And I'm especially heartened even in the face of variants um, emerging now, uh, as we might expect, that the model was built on SARS-CoV-1 and seems to be predictive of SARS-CoV-2, suggesting robustness with respect to variation. So I encourage you to look at the um, preprint if you're interested and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. We were talking the other day about wanting to have success stories about modeling going to clinically meaningful results. And here we have one and a quick one. So I hope there'll be some time. Let's have, we'll t reserve a little time for some questions uh, since we, the discussion for Jacob can run over a bit. Uh, any questions uh, for David while well, he's here? This is John, I do. Please go ahead. Uh, have you have you considered the possibility of going either to the Department of Defense or the VA, who has thousands of retired patients who are on that forum, and they know who they are, and and taking a large sample of them with a very simple survey, two question to to see who thinks they had COVID and who didn't compared to a sample of the population in general, just to see if in fact you had a, a lower percentage of incidents among people who were taking metformin for its primary purpose. You know, I, I had not considered that. Um, the prospect, the uh, retrospective observational study I mentioned was done by uh, Chris Tignanelli here at University of Minnesota using a uh, pretty large data set that United Health Group has here. Um, that's a good suggestion, John. I will, uh, I'll, I'll pose that to Chris Tignanelli and see what he says and let you know. How about that? I'm just curious and kind of the naive. I take metform and I did not have any signs of COVID. So, and a one. That proves it, John. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad that it turned out that way. <laughs> I'm I am one, too. One, sorry, one more question, perhaps. One or two, anyone? So what, what is the working range uh, for the dose of metformin that model predict? 
Yeah, we looked at what what's clinically achievable and um I think like what's typically used around 10, 10 micromolar, 20 micromolar, or something like that. That's kind of a lot of people are using metformin for managing pre-diabetes, diabetes, and um, some people uh, use it for weight loss, and some people think it's even an anti-aging drug. So it's that's the right, that's the clinically observed range, and that's kind of what we're um, that should have a, a significant effect. Other questions? We certainly have time for one more question. Can you explain in simple terms what does it do without uh, getting into details? Like what does metformin do that might target in, in simple words? Yeah, it binds to the, there's this mTORC1, that's the central hub protein that regulates a lot of cellular processes, but one of the major ones is protein synthesis. So in simple terms, the, the, virion, the, the virus to replicate itself has to make lots of copies of the proteins to assemble into new virions. And that, that is a specially sensitive uh, part of, this, of the cycle. Every part is required but targeting them does, doesn't all, targeting the same way doesn't lead to the same output. Some are very vulnerable and some are not. That's a vulnerable one, we predict, okay. yeah. I guess I have one question which may not be short, in which case we'll have to move on, which is the usual problem with antivirals is that by the time you have symptoms, it's too late. Uh, now, in the case of COVID where you have Migrate where you potentially have the COVID moving from the primary source of infection to secondary organs, then uh, antiviral inhibition may be very important. Uh, do you have any insights that you could share into the kind of issue about uh, whether there are particular uh, blocking strategies that might be more effective uh, at, when used for light dosing antivirals as opposed to sort of prophylactic classic antivirals? And Desivir seems to really work as a prophylactic better than as a as a after 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 symptoms drug. Yeah, it might be the re maybe a reason why remdesivir is not strongly effective or stronger in its effect is that it's entering late in the game, and it's it's kind of not the key issue that needs to be managed for those patients at that point. So the earlier we can get these into the into the patients, the better. Our the metformin trial um, is and fluvoxamine are both outpatient. So as soon as someone tests positive, they can uh, fill out the survey to potentially enroll, and then it can be. Uh, currently, it's local courier delivery from our sites in Minneapolis, Chicago, and we will expand to Denver and LA. Uh, but we're going to try to amend the IRB so that we can ship by FedEx anywhere in the U.S. So then anyone can enroll. That will create a little bit of a delay compared to courier, but not much, maybe like half a day to a day delay at most. So that's, we think still early enough. This is, and the end, clinical endpoint primary one is hospitalization. Right, well, in your case, because metformin is so widely used, the prospective trial may, I mean, the retrospective trial may actually be the most valuable because uh, if you find that it's protective of the people who've been taking it already, that's really, you have the opportunity to actually do a prophylaxis study, which is usually very hard to do. Yeah, and I guess as a side comment about the um, observational results, they're, they're kind of more, maybe more striking than at first glance, because you're talking about people who would be pre-diabetic, pre diabetic, which is considered a vulnerability for COVID. Um, and yet that group had lower incidence of uh, hospitalization than the control, or those not on metformin. So there's obviously demographic differences, but that's one that uh, is, I think is kind of intriguing. Yeah, I apologize. We, there are so many fascinating questions coming off your talk, but I, we've got to give Jacob his 20 minutes. So thank you so much for being willing to come. I hope you'll come back and update us on this. And, yeah, thanks uh, a lot. Really for appreciate your participation. Appreciate you inviting me and I uh, appreciate the time. Thanks everybody. <laughs>